Hi, this is Howard Abrams, and this is an introduction to Emacs. So, are you just curious about Emacs? You may have heard of it. Well, I'm going to try to impress you. Are you uh, already impressed? Wanting to get started? I've got some ideas on uh, what might be the, your easiest bet. Now, if you already use Emacs, I may not be able to uh, help too much, but I do have a couple of new minor modes that you might find useful. First, story. Once upon a time, a co-worker of mine uh, asked what editor I was using when we were doing a screen sharing session. I replied, oh, that's just Emacs. Emacs, huh? That's what all the hipsters are using. Hipster? Never thought of myself as trendy, even in the nerd underworld. Gray beard, maybe, but not hipster. But he was pretty adamant that lots of young programmers use Emacs. Surprised enough to poke around, found that he was right. Seems like uh, younger engineers who have their choice of programming environments were not only using Emacs, but also extending and creating really cool things. So I thought I would mention why something so old might prove to be useful to you. Now the details of my life are quite inconsequential. Well, let's just say I used a lot of programming languages and operating systems over the years. But for the last 25 years, I've always had Emacs running. Sure, it wasn't always my primary editor, but it was always there, at least let me take notes. Originally, I would grab a 132 column VT100 terminal, start up Emacs, and start splitting the screen into what we called windows. Here I'd start up a shell in one, a IRC in another, uh, debugger, etc. But that was then. So why Emacs? Emacs may be the oldest successful open source project. It was a poster child for the GNU uh, project long before Linux, and yet it's still actively enhanced and extended year after year. Now if like me you often find yourself using many languages for your project, then you may appreciate Emacs's breadth of capabilities. I've tried to follow Phil Sung's uh, ideas for giving three reasons for Emacs continued success, and I'll show off how easy it is to deeply customize Emacs, then I'll show some of the easy automations, and then some of the cool extensions that I use. I don't want to compare Emacs to other e editors. I mean, if you're happy and productive, that's great. Keep using that finger memory. However, I am surprised how many people feel that customizing an editor amounts to clicking buttons in a preferences pane. Emacs is different. It's an editor you can really craft and bend to your will, not to what somebody else thinks you want. Now, I'm not talking about macros. I mean, yes, Emacs has those. But I want to show you how you can program Emacs with very simple and well, maybe a contrived example. I mean, right now, if I hit Control and then O, it will insert a line below the cursor. But what if you want to insert a line above the cursor? So, every feature is really just a function. So you can start up a scratch editor uh, like this and type Emacs commands in the form of Lisp. So, what I'm going to do is just type in a function here. Um, I'm using a templating system and that's why I'm able to type this uh, a little bit quicker than what you would otherwise. But I'll call this uh, function insert line before, and I put the word my in a slash, uh, well, just so I can distinguish it between other people's things so that you don't have name collisions, since all functions are essentially in the global namespace so that you can directly call them. Now, for arguments, uh, let's not have any for the moment. I'll come back to that though. Now, this little function here, called interactive, just separates the functions that are used by other functions and those that you call directly. So, I want to make sure this is interactive. Now, what do I need to do? Oh, one thing, if you do have something that's interactive, you should be able to put a, um, a you know, essentially some documentation as the first thing in the function. Eh, I'll type something like that. Yeah, I preloaded it. All right, now let's get back to what we want this to do. It should take like three steps. First, wherever the cursor is, I'll move to the beginning of the line, and then I'll insert a carriage return. Then I just want to go back to where I was. 
Okay, now first of all, you're probably thinking carriage return? What if I'm editing an MS-DOS file or, you know, uh, maybe a Unicode issue or something along those lines? Well, okay, so Emacs has a different function called newLine, and that essentially will insert a new line. Now, any function, see how I've got the cursor next to the parenthesis, and so it's highlighting that entire parenthesis, uh, that entire expression. If I hit Control X and then E, it actually executes it, so I can see what it does, and it inserts a new line. Perfect. Okay, but now let's go back to where I started. Now, Emacs has another uh, uh, other feat, uh, function called Save Excursion. Now, Save Excursion essentially stores what your what your state is now, executes a few things as you know that you pass in as parameters, and then goes back to what it was before. That's just exactly what I need. So I move these two things inside, close up my function. I think I'm ready to rock and roll. All right, Control X, Control E, and now I have you know essentially evaluated this function, and I can try it out. All right, I need an example here. So let's get a couple of lines here. I'm going to go to the queue. Okay, so here I am on this queue, and I should be able to put a line in between this and not move my cursor at all. That's my goal. Now, I want to run this function, so you do meta x, and then you just type it in. My insert line before, and I can hit tab to complete it. Return. Perfect. That's just what I want. However, you don't want to do meta x my insert line before every time you want to just put a line before your cursor. So let's bind it to some key stroke, some key binding, some key chord. Yeah, let's see. The way we do it is with the global set key command. And I'll just bind it to Control, Shift, and O. And that's what this section right here tells me. The C is Control, the S is Shift, and the O is just, well, the letter O. And here we go. So I just moved down here, do Control E, and now I've defined that and ran it. So let's go back up here and move back to my Q, and let's try. Control, Shift, and O. Perfect. Just what I wanted. Let's move back up, because I want to try something more. Now, each function can go, um, uh, can take a parameter. So, let's type in times. What this means, and my interactive thing should be a P, meaning I take a parameter, and new line here, will take a number of times. So what this does here is if I hit any uh, a control and a number, it'll pass that number to this function when it calls it. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go back to my queue. I type in control 6 and then control shift O. Dang it. I forgot to evaluate it. All right, Control and X. Let's try that one more time. Okay, Control 6, Control Shift O, and there we go. We have six lines being inserted. Now, my point to all of this is just to show you just how easy it is to customize Emacs in an and extend it in, in Lisp and in such a way that you can kind of see why people write Twitter clients in Emacs, and mail clients, and all sorts of things. Next, I want to show off some of the standard text editing capabilities. I mentioned Vim Golf because I think it's a great idea to master your tools, and Tim Vischer has produced a series of interesting videos of him trying to beat the VI records with Emacs. While this sort of practice can be useful, don't read too much into it. Vischer considers Control-Alt-X to be one keystroke, since it's pressed at the same time. However, some may call that three finger presses. Anyway, let me show you some new features that have been recently added uh, to Emacs by hipster programmers that I did not use 20 years ago. First, let's create a, uh, an HTML file. In fact, what would be nice is if I'm editing this HTML file, 
I actually see what's being done. Here's a little magic I'll uh, use that uh, actually runs a web server within Emacs. And a little bit of JavaScript running here in my bra uh, browser will be able to view it. Kind of cool and quite useful. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to use a minor mode called Emmet to actually uh, write a bunch of HTML with a with something that looks kind of like CSS. So, UL, you know all about that. Pound, um, let's call it fruits. Dot I. Dot oh I don't know fruit and times five. Okay, so this little CS, well, CSS kind of, will get translated to this HTML. And that's exactly what I want, so I hit return, and I have a bunch of, well, list items. Okay, now normally you would think that you could make a, a macro to change this kind of stuff. For instance, if you hit F3, and then I can hit return, return, tab, and then I could search for this to get in position. And if I hit F4, that ends the macro. Now if I hit F4 again, I can just go through and create uh, a bunch of changes. Now that's great if everything is exactly the same, but let's suppose it's not the same, but close. Well, first of all, I need some data, so let's type in a few. Apples, oranges, uh, bananas, because everybody likes bananas, right? Um, grapes, and kumquats. There we go. All right, so here I have some fruit that are all fairly similar, or, or at least how they look is. All right, let's pop up here, and if I go to something that is the same on each one of these things, I can do Control shift dot to create more cursors wherever it matches. Now I have a whole bunch of little cursors that I can select some words, copy it to my buffer, move around, ID, and paste, and lowercase that, and type item and get rid of the S and now they match all my CSS tags. I don't know, that's pretty amazing. Now another feature uh, that Emacs uses quite a bit is the concept of a REPL. Now a REPL, yeah, you may be familiar with it, it stands for read, evaluate, print, and then loop. What it does is it allows you to start up some engine in some other language and run commands in it. Now in this case, I'm using a language called Clojure. Let me make this REPL a little bigger. So up above I have Clojure code, but down below I actually have an engine running and Emacs has created a little window with a connection to it. This allows me to not have to jump over into a terminal. I can just stay right within Emacs and use all of Emacs's key bindings. I can type in 42. Hey, I can type in hello world. And I can evaluate um, math expressions here. So this allows me to kind of explore functions and libraries that, uh, that, that this language happens to have available. But that's not usually how we, you want to run it. Generally, it's up here where you're typing in code. Here I've got a function called factor. And let me just make that a little smaller. And like I was doing with the Lisp code, I can do uh, a little expression or a little key binding to send that to my REPL. Now this factor question mark is now in my um, engine down below, which allows me to come over here and run some other things, like little tests to validate that my function actually works. 
Now, each language has to be supported differently, and some obscure languages, maybe somebody hasn't written something for it, as far as bindings like this goes, but most of your major ones uh, work quite well, like Python and Ruby, and well, I'll show you JavaScript here. Here I'm going to use JavaScript to illustrate another project that I think is quite cool and interesting. Now, first though, down below here in this lower window, I have another REPL, another engine. This one's running Node.js. It allows me to type all the kind of expressions that you would expect, including those without semicolons. Now, I can also do things like console.log. This, al this allows me um, to actually print things. Now, of course, it also displays what's returned, and console.log doesn't return anything, and that's why I get an undefined here. Well, let's pop back up here. I can send things from my JavaScript buffer down to my uh, REPL down below to evaluate it. However, it's not quite as clear what you want to send. You know, in Lisp languages, you have parentheses that identify expressions. Not quite so much here in JavaScript land. But the expand regions allow me to do control equal sign in order to highlight some syntactical section. If I hit it again, it expands it. I can hit it again and again and again and again to get the entire function. You might notice that the indention is really quite terrible with this function. Now that it's highlighted, I can just hit tab and have everything formatted nicely. That's good. Oh, I notice there's a little red line down there at the bottom. I can hit another key, since this red line is being done by a lint checker, and it shows me that I've got an unnecessary semicolon. Well, let's just get rid of that. Okay, now let's send this whole expression down to my REPL. Once again, control equal, and I can, oh, in this case, I only had to hit it twice since I was already near the edge. I send it down to the REPL, that's why there's all those little dots, and now this function is now defined in the engine. Now I can pop down here and hit control equal twice and send it down there. Hey, I figured it would be true. Let's do one that's false. Excellent. So now I can do the same sort of thing I did in one language in JavaScript. I think I better stop for a second and explain what that green F is in my JavaScript code. I'm not doing anything special as far as the actual language goes, it's just how I display JavaScript. The F is really the word function. I just tidy it up a bit. Let me show you what I mean. If I pop up here to this line and pop over here to the F and I hit the backspace, it deletes the N that's really there and I see the word functio. But as soon as I hit an N, the word function now gets redisplayed as a green italic looking F just makes it a little easier on the eyes for me since I don't really want to see that word all over the place. I know it's there and it's okay for me. This is an extension that I've added. You don't have to use it yourself. Anyway, what I wanted to show at this point was templates, or another word for snippets. This is very popular in just about every language, or, or every IDE, as it allows you to quickly write patterns of code uh, very easily. For instance, at this point, I want to iterate over all the prime numbers that I've got listed in this array. Well, to do that, we'll use the each method. But I type each and hit tab to kick off a snippet. Now, this snippet has uh, some spots where you replace it with something that you want. In this case, I don't want the word collection. I want my actual collection, so I type primes. Now I hit the tab key to go to the next section. And this next section needs, um, needs the iterator. So I'll just put P. And then I hit tab again, 
And that finishes off the snippet, leaving me inside my little block of code where I can then type, you know, something that I want. How does this work? Well, this is what it looks like. This is the t each template. As you can tell, it looks a lot like TextMate and just about every other one. You know, dollar sign two here. Let me pop down here. Dollar sign two is the um, second position that the cursor will go to when you hit tab. Dollar sign one here has a default value. That's with the little curly braces and the colon and the word collection. It's kind of slick. The one nice thing about um, Emacs's version is you can have default values based on some uh, Lisp expression code that you run first. Kind of, uh, it's a sweet deal. Now Emacs, well, yes, it is quite ancient. However, it's still actively being extended and all kinds of cool little mini applications exist for it. I'm going to show you some of the big major extensions that I think is really cool. These have all been created this century. Now the first I want to show you is org mode. If you don't use Emacs for anything else, org mode is it. It's really that critical application that has really been kind of life transforming for a lot of people like me. Here you take a normal text file that's just got a little bit of markup looks kind of like Markdown. And what it can do is if I turn on the mode, org mode, things become a little different. We get syntax highlighting. All the headers now are collapsed by default and we can expand them. This is kind of the same sort of property that you saw before with that word function in JavaScript being shrunk to a single F. It's the same sort of approach. So here I can expand it with the tab key. Each of these things that were in square brackets are now actual hyperlinks that I can click on. A list is, well, just a list. However, with the Alt key, I can shift these elements around. Tables are actually pretty bitchin' because I can come down here and actually move the columns around, move the rows around. I can even do little mini uh, calculations on them as well. And another nice thing, like let's suppose I was going to add a new line here. Who happens to be 202? Probably Count Dracula. There we go. The Count. I don't know. I just screwed up my whole formatting. That means I'm going to have to insert a whole bunch of spaces, right? No. I just move it. It automatically will reformat it. Now so far, this is just organizing notes, but it can also do GTD-like things. Any word with the keyword to do is something I need to get done. Like give this presentation. Using, uh, I can quickly mark it off and say it's something I, I've got done. And when it does, it pulls up a little thing saying, add a note for why you got this done. This time I recorded the session. But my favorite feature is the literate programming abilities. What this means is I can type just regular notes, but I can embed source code inside it. For instance, here I've got a little bit of a block of source code that I can call to the, my regular shell. Inside it, if I hit Control c twice, that's executed. The results are put back into my notes. Now, of course, it figured it out that it's a table. Perfect. I can do just the same sorts of features that I did before in trying to, um, that I was, well, <laughs> that I was doing above in reorganizing things. I can even collapse it so I don't even have to see it at times. Here I've got a little bit of Python. This just generates a random number of numbers. Well, here they are. Now, in this case, I can use, um, well, whoops, sorry, wrong key. Here, let me use the mouse here, 
I've created a, uh, the results are being named as Pythonic numbers. This, because I've got a name associated with it, means I can use these names as a variable in another code snippet. This time I'll use Emacs Lisp to count the number of random numbers that I came up with. There we go. I had it pre-cached. So, you can kind of see the abilities that you might can uh, see when you're trying to deal with something very large and complex. You can actually talk it out amongst yourselves in your own head by typing all the notes and the snippets of code that you want to work with and how it might all tie together. There's a different philosophy with Emacs than with other editors like VI. In VI, you start off in the shell, you change directories, you edit a file, you do commands, but you're primarily shell-focused. The editor just happens to be something that you call to. The philosophy with Emacs is just the opposite. You start off in Emacs, and then you only call the shell when you need, when you need something else. For instance, here I've got a shell script, and oh no, I need to make sure it's um, executable. Well, I don't pop out to a, uh, a terminal to do this. I can just hit a simple command and type in a shell command directly from Emacs. Change mode. I can even do a tab to have it completed. Perfect. Now if I need to do more, I can actually run a shell within Emacs. Now in this case, I can type things like ls. I can do all my fancy regular shell stuff that I want to do, but in a um, but just in a tiny window where I can still use the Emacs bindings. Well, let me go through that. Now it's very easy while I'm in a single file to commit it to git or CVS or Mercury or any of the other ones that you might want to use. Um, however, Git uh, has a really nice Git, feed, uh, Git package called, uh, well, I like to call it Maggot because I think it's kind of cool, but it's probably pronounced Magit or something that rhymes with magic. It is really nice. Here I've got a listing of all of my files that are untracked, the ones that are unstaged, here I've got them staged. I can hit the C key in order to commit what I've got staged. I can fetch and pull, change branches. I can do everything right from within the Emacs. I hit the L key twice and I get a listing of all the check-ins that I've done. It's pretty slick and pretty sweet. Now the last one that I want to show you is something that's actually kind of recent to Emacs. It's a, a repository where you can actually share uh, major packages that we've created. Before, I guess we were all just using FTPs or, oh, maybe Gopher. Anyway, there's uh, four main repositories that you can use depending on how bleeding edge you want to live. Because Emacs is so easy to uh, work with and create new things, uh, I don't know, I think it's kind of funny that uh, on the third, Apple announced uh, Swift, and the next day, somebody had already created a package for it. Now that you're sufficiently stunned and amazed by the wonderfulness of Emacs, you're probably wondering, how do I get started? All right. I'm kind of thinking that for someone who has never used Emacs before, but you have a Mac, you should probably start off with Aqua Max. It's a very Mac-ish e Emacs. All the windows that you've been seeing me use are really now in this editor just tabs. You got a toolbar, you've got all the uh, command options like Command O and Command S that you're kind of used to in most Mac applications. The nice thing about it though is that you still have Control and Alt uh, used as uh, what they are used in Emacs. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, 
Of course, that's going to be a little different on other app, uh, on other operating systems like Linux or Windows. Once you start up Emacs, how do you learn it? A lot of people have been weighing in on this. I'm kind of thinking, just hit Control H and then the T key, and it'll bring up a tutorial. It's built into Emacs. There's also a number of different uh, online videos that you can watch. I do recommend Learn Emacs by itself. Don't try to learn it while you're learning some strange language like Clojure. I do think that uh, flashcards are quite useful for some of the bindings just to kind of get used to those key chords. Sasha Chua has created a number of uh, very nice graphical notes. I'll put them in the link down below. Perhaps maybe you just learn a trick a day. Maybe just, uh, well, I take little um, sticky notes and I just put them on my computer each day when I learn something new and then I just try to remember to uh, use it. Also, if you've got a friend, you can bounce ideas, share code, share ideas. It's great fun. I've also written a blog entry. Now, every function in, in Emacs is available by just typing Alt-X and then the name of the function, like sort lines. But uh, while you can use the tab to expand it, yeah, you pretty much want to have a key chord. However, those are great until you run out of keys. So let me show you a couple of little tricks you should do with your uh, key bindings as soon as you can. Otherwise, you might need a couple of extra arms when you're using Emacs. So first of all, get rid of that damn caps lock. Who the hell types in all caps anyway? Most uh, operating systems, like the Mac, uh, allow you to change it to a control key. Do that because you're going to use a control a lot more than you will a caps lock. Now, most keyboards, it seems like, have um, the, what do you call them, system meta keys on both sides of your space bars. Like there's two command keys and two alternate keys. This means that if you're going to use, well, say the N, do an alt with the left, uh, the, the left alternate key before hitting the N with your right hand. If you get used to using both hands like that, It'll probably help with your uh, with the dreaded Emacs pinky. Of course, you're kind of thinking, there's only one control key. That's a bad idea. I suggest uh, there's a program, at least for the Mac, called Key Remap for MacBook. This one allows you to bind the return key to be a control key if it's used with something else. If you hit it alone, just as a regular control, or a regular return, it's really quite useful. Now, if you're not, well, if you haven't already learned the Emacs key bindings, you might want to look at the Ergo Emacs bindings. As you can tell, a lot of these are pretty logical, and they're a lot more focused in the center and not so much on the edges. Now, a lot of people swear by evil mode. They just think it's the greatest thing because it really gives you the power of VI as far as navigation goes, but then you can use all the cool customization features without having to use VimScript. Couple of final tips and tricks. Don't use the arrow keys a lot. Instead, just search for the word you want. Control S, and then you just start typing the word that you want, and it jumps right to it. If there's more than one word, you just hit Control S a second time and you jump to the second occurrence. It's quite quick and easy. Get used to that. Alt N is actually quite useful, and I think I better demonstrate this one. Hold on, let me turn my cursor back on here. So here I... Yes, you did realize my presentation was actually an Emacs, right? So here my cursor is on the word jump. If I hit Alt N, it jumps to the next word of jump. And I can keep on doing that. It's kind of slick. It allows you to jump through things really quickly. All right, now I'm going to turn that off because that's a little distracting. Okay, so the other thing is each command, well, just about all of them, will take a, um, a, a kind of a times argument like we saw when I was typing in that Elisp code. So Alt-9 and then Alt-B will jump back nine words. And Control-5 uh, and Control-P 
will jump up five lines. Hmm, maybe I should demonstrate that. I often hit things like this, where I have a relative, uh, relative line numbers instead of absolute ones. I get my cursor back here. So now, if I want to jump up to the line where it says Alt N, that's five lines up, I can just hit Control 5, Control P, and I'm on that line. If I want to jump down to where it says Control 5, Control P, that's Control 6, Control N. Yeah, it's easier to do it than to say it. No more cursor. Let's keep going. Now Emacs has a lot of syntax highlighting and limited support for many languages. Probably not good enough. We want things like auto-completion and like that REPL stuff I was showing earlier. For that, use uh, check out the Prelude project. They happen to have a lot of um, package collections for many of the languages you might be interested in. In summary, Mastering any instrument takes dedication, effort, and time, and Emacs is no exception. However, you'll be useful quite quickly. Just kind of treat it like a notepad, um, and then use the arrow keys, and little by little learn some of the new uh, key chords that uh, bring in more power as you get used to it. So, any questions? And, um, yes, MetaX Butterfly does exist. Thank you.